Hello, welcome to our weekly Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis webinar. This is our open forum for pharmacists. We've been doing this for 30 something weeks at this point and we are so happy and pleased that you've joined us. We know we have many of you who are regulars who attend each and every week. We appreciate your commitment and for those of you who are new this week, welcome for the first time uh, to our webinar. I'm Michael Hogue. I'm the Dean of Pharmacy at Loma Linda University in California, and I'm also the President of the American Pharmacists Association. I serve as the moderator for our webinar each and every week. This week, we're excited to be talking about a subject that is very important in the time that we're living in. It's a, it's a subject about ethics. We're gonna talk a little bit about ethics and pharmacy today. Um, we really wanna look at, as COVID-19 vaccine comes uh, to market, we know that there are gonna be restricted quantities of the vaccine and a need to prioritize those individuals who receive the vaccine first. And I wanna discuss with you today with our guests, the uh, ethical principles behind making those decisions I want pharmacists to be able to understand how um, these uh, ethical decisions have to be made in the context of national recommendations, and you need to be able to protect yourself legally. Now, we've got two wonderful experts joining us today. Uh, and in addition uh, to myself, part of our program today is going to be moderated by Elisa Bernstein. Now, many of you know Elisa because she joins us every week Senior Vice President for Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs. Elisa has a 30-year history of uh, practice with the Food and Drug Administration before she came to APHA just a little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. Elisa's going to be doing our audience Q&A today, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few moments. Uh, but uh, we're also extremely proud that we're going to have Dan Albrandt with us today. Dr. Albrandt uh, is a pastor at the Madison United Methodist Church uh, in uh, Northern Virginia. Uh, he's also a pharmacist uh, and uh, has a, lot, a wealth of knowledge in uh, emergency pharmacy medicine and uh, acute care pharmacy. Uh, he can bring uh, these skills together as we discuss the ethics uh, behind the use of COVID-19 vaccine as well as Dr. Eddie Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg is Assistant Dean of Student Affairs and Professor of the Department of Pharmacy Practice at West Coast University School of Pharmacy uh, in Los Angeles. So we're very pleased to have both of these experts with us to discuss both these legal and ethical aspects. During the Q&A time, we'll also be joined this week by Dr. Dan Zlot, who is our uh, Senior Vice President for Education and Business Development. And as you know, Dan handles our clinical questions each week on COVID-19. Um, if you have any questions about COVID-19, even if it's not on the topic of ethics, we'll be happy to take those questions during our open time. And uh, Dan will do his best to respond to your questions related to uh, clinical issues. Mitch Rothholtz, um, with APHA staff, our Chief of Governments and State Alliances will also be on to talk a little bit about any policy related issues with vaccines that might come up. He'll add his wisdom and knowledge to this as well. So um, we are offering continuing education for today's program. We do that once a month. So you happen to be online at the time that we're doing this. The continuing education is only available for those who have joined the program live today and will not be available for those who are watching the program uh, asynchronously after uh, the date of live airing. Uh, there are no declarate, uh, declared conflicts of interest for any of our speakers or program planners today. Our uh, CPE information, this is for pharmacists and for pharmacy technicians, and our learning objectives are shown on this next slide. Uh, uh, the, we'll discuss vaccine prioritization and how that's a little bit different from vaccine distribution. We'll also talk about the ethical principles that are guiding the COVID vaccine prioritization schedule, and we're gonna discuss some ethical scenarios that might face pharmacists in real practice so that you can be prepared to be able to handle those scenarios. Now let's just test your knowledge up front here. We'll, we'll not actually do polling, but I'll just ask you to read the question and think in your own mind, how would you respond to this question? 
All of the following are ethical principles guiding the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices decisions regarding prioritization of groups to receive the COVID vaccine, except which? Justice, sustainability, transparency, equity, and maximum benefits and minimize harms. This is not an easy question. We'll get into that later. Pharmacists and other healthcare providers who order and administer COVID-19 vaccine must follow the ACIP recommendations for prioritization. Is that true or false? Well, we'll get into this today in the program. And you've just gotten a shipment of COVID-19 vaccine. A patient picks up a prescription and asks if she can receive the vaccine. What should be your response to this request? Should you determine if the patient fits? Determine if they have insurance coverage to pay for it? Let her know she's eligible or administer the vaccine immediately. What do you do in this circumstance when we have limited quantities? So we're going to dive into all of these things today. And after this short introduction, we're going to talk to Dan Albrandt and Eddie Rosenberg and get their opinions and insights based on these national standards. If you uh, are uh, joining us for the first time, let me give you a brief orientation. We take questions at any point during the webinar. You can enter your questions into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Type them now if you have questions. We'll be happy to receive those, and we'll try to address as many of those as we can, either during the discussion or during the open Q&A session. Uh, that'll be coming just a little bit later and facilitated by Elisa Bernstein. So you go ahead and put those questions in now. We'll be happy to receive them. Uh, and then also, uh, we love to give our um, audience members the opportunity to ask their questions verbally. So if you type a question in the box, uh, we'll call on you to actually ask your question verbally at the appropriate time. And if you're joining by computer audio, you'll notice on the GoToWebinar control panel a little microphone. It's either green or it's orange. If it's orange, it means you're muted. If it's green, it means you're unmuted. Uh, when the staff unmute your line, you'll want to be sure you click on that and make sure that your microphone's green so that we can hear you, so that you can speak. If you're joining via cell phone or landline phone, you'll need to enter your audio pin that's on the GoToWebinar control panel into your telephone in order for your phone line to be active so that we can unmute you and hear you from there. But if none of that works for you and you still have a question and you don't have audio, just say no audio in your question and uh, Elisa will ask your question for you when we get to that portion of the Q&A section. Finally, your handout for today is available on the handout tab in the GoToWebinar control panel. All of the links are active to active references, and so you can just jump right into those and be able to investigate those on your own. And as always, we record our webinars each week. It'll be available at pharmacist.com within about 24 hours after we finish today's webinar. So you're welcome to send your friends there too uh, to listen to this webinar content. Again, continuing education is only offered to those who join today's session live. Now I'm going to invite our guests today, Dan and Eddie, to join me on the screen. If you'll please activate your cameras. Uh, Dan and Eddie, we're going to, we've got a big topic today. Uh, we probably could spend a couple hours talking about this, don't you think, Dan? <laughs> yes, I do. Thanks for asking me to be with you today, Michael. And um, so, so um, uh, I think we've got just a few slides here. I want to bring up our first slide, which is about the World Health Organization. So, so when we talk about ethics and ethical frameworks, um, uh, ethics is something that's not just a local con conversation. It's a, it's a global conversation. And uh, Dan, I, I wonder if you could just give a reflection briefly on these six principles that the World Health Organization has said, you know, uh, you should uh, consider these things, governments, when you're thinking about prioritization. Yeah, I think it's really important for us because we tend to be, as, as most people do, we tend to be very national centric. So, you know, we're going to take care of our own first, and then we're going to think about distributing to the rest of the world. And, and I think in a pandemic, you have a situation where seven and a half billion people are potentially in need of this vaccine. It's not just the 330 million United States citizens. And so 
you have to think a little bit broader. Um, most of us in pharmacy are not going to be in the place where we are determining where those vaccines go to. We're working through wholesalers, we're working through other buying groups. However, I think keeping the, the ethical ideal of thinking about we're all part of the same world, we're all part of the same human family, we need to make sure that ethically we're thinking beyond just our own needs. Right, absolutely. Uh, we go to the next slide. Um, just bringing it back to the US, uh, or, well, yes, the SAGE priorities groups do uh, attempt to make some prioritization about what they feel makes the, sense, makes the most sense in terms of limited resource. And, um, you know, populations with significantly elevated risk and uh, uh, those who may have increased risk of severe disease or death and these prioritizations. Eddie, is there anything about this that you know stands out to you uh, in terms of looking at lists of people? Um, you know, how, how do you look at these lists uh, as a pharmacist and say, hmm, okay, uh, who am I going to immunize first? Eddie, you're muted, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, so the host just unmuted me. I uh, apologize for that. Um, so I think the, um, the basic thing is that the day-to-day -day pharmacist is not gonna be the one um, making the decision as to the prioritization of certain populations. That's kind of already done for us in the phasing um, model um, under the National Academies and ACIP guidelines. So following the guidelines would be um, the easiest way to proceed and also the standard of care. Um, so it's not the individual pharmacist's decision um, necessarily which group is gonna get it. Yeah, so you mentioned the National Academies. I do wanna bring up the next slide, which gives us a little bit about the National Academies framework. So, so the CDC uh, and HHS did ask the National Academies of Science and Medicine to uh, look at a ethical principles framework and uh, understanding that there's some overarching goals in our country that our nation has decided that we have to look at. First of all, we want to reduce severe morbidity and mortality uh, and the negative societal impact due to the transmission of uh, SARS-CoV-2, and that's an important thing. And then uh, we need to look at how we then allocate in order to decrease the risk of acquiring infection, but not only that, decreasing the severity of the disease, in other words, decreasing morbidity and mortality and the ne negative societal impacts. And of course, there's a lot of those uh, societal impacts that are significant because of uh, essential workers and so forth. And so essentially what happens is that the National Academies came up with a four allocation phase framework. And we'll go to the next slide and you can see uh, that uh, these concepts of maximum benefit, equal concern, and mitigation of health inequities uh, are three of uh, six principles that really that uh, were considered by the, uh, uh, by the uh, National Academies. And so um, I wanna uh, see, Eddie, if just for a moment, could you talk about, uh, we're just gonna take one of these for the moment. Could you talk about equal concern. What is equal concern? And, you know, from a legal standpoint, how do you take into account equal concern? Uh, it's basically, equal concern is basically valuing the dignity of every population, every person and population. Now, one of the things in this public health context of a pandemic is to remind ourselves that, um, public health principles actually tip in favor of the larger societal good, more so than civil liberties and individual cases. So we're looking at the global concern for all populations to be considered equally. So not, dis not disparaging, not discriminating, uh, and not putting any one over the other. Yeah. So one of the scenarios that I think would play out in our minds, and I'm I'm uh, maybe jumping ahead just a little bit because we haven't gotten to the ACIP guidelines yet. But but let's say um, Dan, uh, from an ethics standpoint, you have one dose of COVID vaccine that you can administer, and let's say that you have 
two people standing mm -hmm. in your pharmacy who want to receive the vaccine, okay? What goes through your mind in determining which one of those two people uh, gets that vaccine? And as Dan's talking about that, we'll switch to the next slide so that our audience can see the other three principles that the National Academies talks about, uh, fairness, transparency, and evidence-based. So Dan, two people standing in your pharmacy, both want that vaccine. They think they're entitled to it. How is the pharmacist going to decide? Is it who can pull their checkbook out the fastest or their debit card out the fastest? How, how do you He's decide? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it starts with what Eddie pointed out early, which is that every pharmacist making a decision on who to administer vaccine to has to follow the prioritization schedule. Um, that's what's going to keep them out of difficulty. That's also what's going to support them in their decision making. So they, if the two people are in all cases equal, um, that's going to be a really hard decision. That's going to be a really hard choice. And it may be, and what I would suggest from an ethical standpoint and just from a kind of a patient care standpoint, is that you talk with both patients and say, here's the reality. I only have one dose of vaccine left, and there's two of you here. Both of you should be getting this vaccine today, but I don't have enough doses. Which of you would like to wait? I should have some more in, in whatever that, that time frame is, and invite that other person back. But allow those two people to dialogue with you to make that choice together. And in that situation, then you have you know, the ability to, to not just arbitrarily decide on your own, but to engage in the conversation and build a relationship uh, with both of those people. Yeah. Eddie, what are your thoughts about that? Got two I don't people disagree. standing in front no. of you. You got to immunize one. Who, who do you pick? So I don't disagree with Dan. There, and I tell my students in an ethics class that there's not always a right and wrong decision. Um, as long as you can ground your decision making in some sort of foundational ethical principle, that's fine. Um, so Dan's basing it on evaluating it on the spot. Um, what these guidelines have done is kind of take the guesswork out of it um, and give you a foundation to rely on. So if you say, well, the guidelines say based on evidence-based, evidence-driven risk assessment, this person over this person, then I'm bound to do this because that's what I'm going to do. That's not wrong, and it's not. It's neither right or wrong. It's fine. Um, and Dan's approach is also fine. Just need to know how you're evaluating it. Do it methodically and not uh, knee jerk. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. have the. Oh, go ahead, Dan. Also, make sure you document your choice. Oh, it's absolutely, true. absolutely. Yeah. Document your yeah. rationale exactly. Documentation is so important, and if you ever find yourself uh, pharmacists in these sorts of uh, situations where you're having to make ethical decisions about who gets the vaccine and who doesn't, uh, and you're unsure, uh, you know, uh, another tip I'd give you is to really discuss things out with a colleague. I mean, sometimes when you're in community pharmacy practice, you can feel a little bit isolated. You may be the only pharmacist on shift you might need to phone a friend. I mean, you might need to actually pick up the telephone and, and talk to someone and talk it out and say, look, I'm trying to make a decision about this or that. And you say, well, I don't have time for that. But it may be the best moments that you spend is actually getting into a little bit of a conversation. And I'll have the staff go ahead and pull up uh, uh, of the ACIP ethical framework uh, document or uh, slide because I want to show you, I gave you the National Academies of Practice. We kind of went over those principles in two slides. Uh, let's move on to one more uh, ahead. Yes, this is the slide I want us to look at. So this is what the ACIP so far is proposing as their basis for making decisions uh, on the ACIP, maximizing benefits and minimizing harm, equity, justice and fairness and transparency and justice and fairness as concepts are very, very similar. You might be just splitting hairs on what the difference is between justice and fairness. So it's probably really just four basic principles here. Transparency, justice, fairness, equity, maximize benefits and minimizing harms. So 
you know, that's a very important thing to do. Now, process-wise, giving this getting this framework, we now know what's underlying ACIP. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot in the media about a concern about the politicization of who's going to get vaccine first. There's been a lot of political uh, commentary about that. But if this underpins, if this ethics framework underpins that decision making, you know, um, uh, what, what is your thoughts then about uh, allocation? If CDC is following an ethical framework, does that strengthen the provider, i.e. pharmacist's uh, position in being able to make decisions about who gets vaccinated? Uh, what's your opinion? Does, does an ethical framework like this that underpins that, does that strengthen the pharmacist uh, or give the pharmacist something to fall back on? Dan? I think it does, Michael. I think I think that framework is a really good model to uh, educate everyone on. So everybody throughout the organization, whichever organization you're working in, should know these doc these frameworks and use them routinely to make decisions. In that way, you're going to have the best opportunity to make good ethical, good patient care decisions. So not only ethical, but moral decisions and take into account the fact that for some period of time, we're going to have a situation where we're not going to have as much vaccine potentially as we have demand for it. Um, we're going to have multiple vaccines potentially coming out in serial fashion. So that's going to be another difficulty. We all know, having been in pharmacy practice for forever, um, that even in the best situations that the wholesalers don't get the drug, the manufacturers get behind, maybe there's a manufacturing GMP problem. You know, we have all sorts of things that can happen to the, to the allocation and, the, and affect the distribution. Um, but if we focus in practice on this ethical framework, we're going to take the best care of the patients that we can. So, so Eddie, let me just um, tell you, you know, right now, uh, ACIP has not yet released its uh, tiering, but I can tell you from the H1N1 pandemic, uh, many pharmacists will remember that there was a tiered approach to vaccinating against H1N1. And that first tier included uh, healthcare workers and it included uh, certain, uh, it included pregnant women and, and uh, it included children. Uh, we know that pregnant women and children won't probably be part of the first tier with this vaccine because of the lack of safety data or efficacy data in those populations. Uh, but we don't know that yet for certain. We have no idea. Um, but there's going to be some tiering. So there's going to be some groups that are uh, that the CDC uses these ethical basis of these ethical frames to make some decisions, and eventually they're going to come to a recommendation, Eddie. And so. Let's say that you work, I'm going to do some scenarios here, and Eddie, I, I really want you to uh, chime in as an attorney here and give me a, your opinions about this. Let's say that a chain pharmacy organization were to receive a large quantity of COVID-19 vaccine, and uh, they were to instruct um, the pharmacists in the site to just administer it to all comers. Would that be ethical and would that be a legally defensible position? My employer told me to do it if the CDC was only on tier one and hadn't yet moved to tier two, tier three, and tier four. Tier four meaning that all uh, people get the vaccine. Talk to me about that. So, okay, um, as a premise, I'm going to, um, just clarify, what I'm offering you is my educational uh, guidance on the questions you're posing. I'm not providing counsel to any, you know, chain pharmacy uh, or pharmacist, and I would advise anyone who has a specific question like this to, and that is why I would recommend anyway, respective counsel or your insurance carrier. However, okay, so legal liability. Um, I think your question is multi-part, uh, has multiple parts. Um, the PREP Act 
does immunize pharmacy responders from ordinary civil liability, ordinary negligence. So that's basically the common negligence um, falling below the standard of care. What ASIP guidelines provide is a standard of care. And so if you follow the guidelines, and if you follow the phasing that's being proposed, maybe not announced, being proposed, then you should be safe. Um, the other part of the PREP Act is that it, immun it guarantees immunity, but only if you qualify, well, the qualified persons are those who, uh, pharmacists who orders or administers, the intern who orders or administers uh, vaccines under the supervision of pharmacist to people three, three through 18, but there are three preconditions. In order to qualify for that immunity, the guaranteed immunity from ordinary negligence, you need to A, have the requisite training and licensure. So your actions, whatever you're immunizing, you need to be trained and licensed to do. Um, you have to comply with the ACIP schedule or phases, um, whatever those are or will be. And you also have to continue with the record keeping and reporting obligations. That guarantees you civil um, immunity from civil uh, lawsuits uh, for injury um, with regards to um, PrEP and uh, COVID-19 vaccination. Um, now, the, the guidelines themselves are not law. They are guidance. Um, but Congress, in, in developing this PrEP Act, um, basically created an incentive to follow the guidance, which is what they want. They want to have a global responsibility, a national responsibility to abide by these guidelines so that there isn't pandemonium um, in the face of shortage of vaccine. Um, and so it's, it's, a, um, it's a carrot and a stick approach. Congress said, okay, we want these guidelines followed. If you follow these guidelines, you're gonna get, be guaranteed immunity. So as long as you follow the guidelines and exercise ordinary caution, that's fine. Um, the guidelines, however, the guidelines, the, the PREP Act and maybe even state laws don't necessarily cover um, out, other types of negligence like reckless disregard, um, and perhaps not screening somebody properly or proceeding in face of a, a known risk to the person um the they wouldn't cover gross negligence um but by and large the just Im routine immunization would be covered under prep so <clears throat> that's that's very good so we need to do we do need to pay attention as professionals to who we're giving the vaccine to do, doing our best to follow the uh, acip guidelines that probably puts us in the safest position from a legal liability standpoint um, that probably gives us the, the greatest coverage, so to speak. And again, as Eddie said at the beginning, we encourage pharmacists to really uh, discuss with your uh, insurance carriers uh, uh, if you have, if you're an independent pharmacy or you're self-insured uh, uh, because you're an independent practitioner uh, outside of a pharmacy, you'll always want to discuss with your uh, insurance carrier your legal liability. Now, Dan, we're getting ready to move audience, by the way, to audience questions. So please get your questions tied Typed into the question box. We want to, uh, Elisa wants to facilitate your questions here in just a moment. But I do have one last question I want to ask Dan, and it's really about this issue of equity. Um, we, one of the things we've heard so much about are the health disparities that exist in our country and how they've really been exacerbated through the COVID crisis. You know, what responsibility do pharmacists have? in communities for addressing equity as it relates to this vaccine and distribution of the vaccine and so forth. What are your thoughts on that, Dan? So the ethical principle at work here is the ethical principle of distributed justice, where we seek to have an equitable distribution. Equity meaning that we are as good as we can about getting the vaccine out um, to all populations. I right now minister in a county of 13 and a half thousand people where 55 percent of that county are either working poor or impoverished we know that there's a significant issue with those people having adequate transportation to get to places and there's just not many places within the county that i that i minister in where people can come to get 
vaccine. There is no more physician practice. They have moved 20 to 30 miles away. There's one pharmacy. And we don't have a lot of resources in the county. And so much of rural America is that way. I think that pharmacists working in those places need to make sure that they are doing what they can and actively promoting and maybe taking vaccine out to places like churches and other other places where people would gather to administer vaccine um, outside of the four walls of a pharmacy. That proactive stance is going to be the thing that really makes that distributive justice ethic possible in the, in the typical rural uh, pharmacy practice. Yeah, and I think we saw a lot of that in H1N1 where people needed to be vaccinated but couldn't get vaccinated because they had transportation issues or other barriers to, to being able to get access. So a proactive approach of pharmacists is, is, assures that we're practicing at the highest level of ethical practice. And I would just call upon uh, all of us to recall that uh, we are part of a profession and we have a code of ethics that does uh, uh, govern our profession that we hold ourselves to. And I think that's a very important thing to know. Well, uh, Dan and Eddie, thanks for uh, doing a little bit of Q&A with me at this point. Uh, I'm going to go off video and I'm going to call on my uh, wonderful colleague, Elisa Bernstein. She's going to be joining us now in order to be able to take and facilitate questions from our audience. So uh, Dan and Eddie, thanks. And uh, Elisa, it's time for you to come on. Thanks so much. And um, Dan and Eddie, if you can come back on too, please. Great. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we have um, the question box on your on the on your uh, computer, and so please insert any questions that you have. We have a lot, but we certainly will hopefully have time for more. And I'm going to start with the first the first question. If you can open the the mic for Murti Savita, please. I'm on. If, you, are you on? Can you can you yes. ask your question, please? Yeah, Thank I'm you. trying to figure out what is the schedule on this, uh, the storage requirement and the schedule of this. Supposedly, there are two, three doses, and where it will be stored. Well, I'm also going to I to invite on some of my colleagues, um, whether it's by camera or voice, if you if you want to. If you want to join in, Mitch, are you on? Do you want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that, Elisa. Thank you. Thank Good question, you. Marty. Um, so you. let me start with with um, the dosing schedule for the vaccine. So the first two vaccines that we know that are coming out are the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. And and depending upon the vaccines, it'll be either um, it'll be two doses for those vaccines separated by either 21 or 21 eight, 28 days, depending upon which vaccine you're using. Storage, both those are, are required in ultra deep freeze. Um, and so that's the, the, that's the limitation in terms of the requirement for handling is that, that deep freeze. The other vaccines coming out or proposed to come out after that have less stringent temperature storage and also are, are one dose versus two doses. Um, so that's the, the quick answer for, for a complicated um, question. Thank you. So the next question, going back to some of the some of the discussion from earlier with Dan and Eddie, um, Frank, can you want to you want to open the line and ask your question? I know you had a couple of questions, but maybe right now, if you want to ask your question about religious beliefs and some ethics related to that, if not, okay. I can read it. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and read it? Okay. So Dan, I think that Dan, I think this one's for you. How should pharmacists address ethical concerns who have religious objections to use one of the cell lines originally derived from aborted fetal tissue and used to produce a COVID-19 vaccine or other vaccine? Well, so there's two different things at work here. There's, there's ethics and there's religion. <laughs> um, religious beliefs regarding this kind of vaccine and cell line use um, will be a minority of people. 
so the everybody's going to have to figure out what they believe about getting vaccines and how they feel about using it and what the safety profiles seem to be and all of that sort of stuff. So we have free will and we have the ability to make a choice. From a public health standpoint, we obviously want to get as many people vaccinated as we can. Um, but would I go to, to the mat with somebody trying to argue that they should take a vaccine if they if they really truly believe they have a religious reason to not take it, I would not. Um, and I think that's something that employers are going to have to deal with, uh, especially I'm thinking about large uh, hospital systems and those sorts of things that will need to um, vaccinate huge numbers of people with many different religious views and practices. Um, I think those are the ones that are going to have to deal with some kind of ability like they do with influenza you'll just have to mask you'll just have to do everything that you can to prevent transmission you're going to have to get um covid testing routinely um and and you're going to have to do it that way so it'll be much more problematic than potentially getting the vaccine but if there's a if there's a religious reason not to um then then you should honor that that the, the ethical principle of autonomy um the patient's values and um, wishes should be honored um, in that situation. Thanks, Dan. Did you want to have anything on this one? Yeah, so I, I agree with Dan. Um, I It struck me that the question could be asked of about the ethical beliefs or the religious beliefs of the pharmacist. So it's a different perspective or lens that we're looking at. And um, both ethics and law in some states actually do promote the accommodation of a pharmacist's religious beliefs. Um, and in the, in the states that require or require that accommodation and, and perhaps even ethics, um, uh, California is an example. Um, it, it requires a pharmacist who has that the religious belief that is objecting to perhaps giving a vaccine that's based on stem cells. Um, to step aside and not inhibit a patient from getting their medical needs um, addressed. So um, there is an accommodation, even in the little states where there are laws that recognize religious beliefs, and even I think an ethics would be the same. You have a right to your ethical belief, uh, religious beliefs, but you don't have a right to prohibit a patient from getting their needs met. Right. That's a part of it. Dan. Um, we have a couple of questions related to prioritization of pharmacists and healthcare workers. And, and one of the questions that also kind of came up and that, that we've been hearing just in general in, in some of the meetings and, and uh, reports we've been hearing that there's discussion about the difference between allocation, prioritization, and distribution. And there's some conflation about some of the terms and misunderstanding. What's the difference between these? And I wonder if you can just maybe clear, before we go into some of these questions, like clearly define the difference between these three terms. Eddie or Mitch, do you want to take that? Um, so that's fine. I will, um, allocation is basically um, determined by the CDC. Uh, it's based on vaccine supply. And in simple terms, it's a rationing of resources, and it's done equitably, uh, not arbitrarily. And it's basically in this in the in the context of a pandemic, how the vaccine uh, supply will be allocated between countries. A prioritization is basically an orderly phasing process based on evidence based uh, evidence based priority of risk. So certain risk groups were are to receive vaccination within each country based on this phasing. Um, and the phasing is, is determined by evidence-based risk priorities. So um, multiple risks, higher risk factors, um, age, et cetera. Great, thanks. Do you have anything to add, Mitch, or no? I think Eddie did a great job of distinguishing between two. I mean, the, the key driver of this whole situation is 
coming out of the gate, we're going to have limited supply. And so it's going to take looking at the allocations available, looking at the priorities for patient populations that will make the determination as, as, and, and apply ethical and, and evidence-based um, approaches to it. Great. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that for both of you. So if um, let's take a question from Ashley McPhillips, because now that we have the, the clarity there, can you open Ashley's line, please? Can you hear me? So my question was that given that pharmacists are not yet re recognized as healthcare providers, do you think that pharmacists wouldn't be prioritized as much to receive the vaccine versus nurses or doctors or other quote unquote healthcare providers um, and that they would be in a different tier? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> You want me to? I'll start. Eddie. Go ahead, Mitch. We've been involved in some of the discussions at ACIP. Um, is is we are coming out of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, we APHA and others articulated that pharmacists are essential, are are critical for the continuity of care and and serving patient needs. We have pharmacists in in health systems that are dealing with the acute patients uh, who have COVID, um, and so. From the Academy of Medicine's recommendation to discussions that ACIP is having, as well as CDC in some of its guidances, have recognized pharmacists as being essential healthcare providers. There's going to be a tier 1A and a tier 1B. Your 1A will be pro probably providers who are in health systems working with those critical COVID patients. Um, and then 1B will be a little broader. For example, individuals who may be serving high-risk populations in communities, that's all still to be determined ultimately by the ACIP um, for, for considering those tiers and priorities. Um, any, anything you want to share on that perspective? Um, yes, I think by virtue of the fact that, it's a very good question, virtue of the fact that pharmacists interns and technicians are mentioned in or referenced, specifically referenced as um, covered persons um, or qualified persons in the PREP Act indicates that even Congress recognizes pharmacists are essential. They're essential to this initiative as they would be in the future to other similar initiatives. So um, I think just by definition, they would be essential based on the PREP Act. Great, thanks. And just as a follow-up, I'm going to ask a question that came in as well. So, so that's about pharmacists. In reality, will retail pharmacy see the first wave of vaccines for administration? I guess this is more of a, a distribution question. Anybody want to take that? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, again, as I talked about, the, the first wave of vaccines are going to be li limited. The amount of supply is going to be limited and targeted probably to when we talk about those healthcare providers who are most at risk. So the storage requirements require ultra deep freeze storage. So it's gonna be centered around entities that have the ultra deep free freeze freezers or in the packaging that at least one manufacturer has been proposing, it can be stored in that packaging but for a limited period of time. Um, and you also have to be able to handle the, the the volume and the documentation and the storage and handling. So there's some requirements when you sign the agreement of what you commit to, to doing. So that's a limitation. They've got some, some federal contracts for some entities that will be serving uh, long-term care. They came out announcing two of those out front, but there are further discussions looking at where there may be gaps in care. Um, and also through the public health department are looking at their, their health state plan. So in, in, in phase one, it's going to be limited, I would say, in terms of your, your traditional community pharmacy. But in phase two is where we will see uh, pharmacy really engaged. Um, the question is going to be is what are going to be the storage and handling requirements for a vaccine at that time? And who, who has the facility, not even just pharmacy, uh, medicine, medical clinics, public health, all of, across the system, they're going to have to be looking at how can they handle the requirements for storage and handling. Thanks so much, Mitch. Let's go to a question about from um, Q Lynn Lee. Can you open that line, please? I'll 
also related to a question of a pharmacist's decision on whether or not to vaccinate. Thank you for taking my question. So my question is, if um, the vaccine is somehow released prematurely, uh, it don't have enough data, but so good, the preliminary later, they said it's good enough to go ahead and the government is questioning so much, so they just release it. It's just like, it's so short a time and uh, you don't think it's safe or effective. What can you do? Is it like, can you refuse to take that vaccine? Hey. That was all. Are, are you talking about uh, from the provider getting the vaccine or the provider administering the vaccine? Well, kind of both, because if uh, you didn't think you uh, were safe getting yourself, I don't think it would be right to give it to a patient if you don't uh, take it yourself. Who wants to take this so, question? Eddie from Illegal, you want to start there and I could maybe fill in and Dan? So it um it does make sense that if the provider isn't comfortable with the vaccine, um the question is asking, are they comfortable giving it to their patients? So I suppose the premise would be, or the question actually is asking why why would a practitioner not take the vaccine do they know if the fda has approved it is it does it is it so we just recently had efficacy uh, data saying it's 90 percent to 92 percent efficacious but we have no safety data so if we took that vaccine today we would be taking it blindly it might be effective but that doesn't mean it's safe um so it actually depends on what the data shows and and is that physician or practitioner uh, basing it on something they know um, that would hurt the population, or is it something that is personal to them? Maybe they have a high risk, maybe they're allergic to it. Um, so I think there's a lot of other issues that have to be teased out in that question. Yeah, and I guess I would, I would say that we are all going to have to be very vigilant. Um, we all know that these drugs are going to be tested on a few tens of thousands of people. There's placebo controls. When you start to administer these things in 5 million, 10 million, 100 million person quantities, some very small and infrequent side effects are going to come up. We know that. Um, and so it, we need to be continually vigilant on the reports and things like um, reports from the CDC on the MMWR, those kinds of things are going to be invaluable to us to kind of tease out what the what the actual risk might be to certain populations because it could be that certain populations are going to be more at risk for certain side effects than others and when you're talking about giving this to hundreds of millions of people just in the United States billions of people worldwide we are going to learn a lot about this over the course of the first two years, um, but especially the first six months. So I think it is ethically, morally, and uh, responsible practice for pharmacists to stay in the loop and really watch what those side effect profile reports are looking like and watch for the warnings that come out from the government. But, but don't be afraid also to play a role in that and, and be proactive and report adverse effects yourself there's, there's many ways to do that so play a role yourself and be responsible about reporting things that you see within your own practice um i agree with that too and just so that the audience understands there's a risk and a benefit to every single drug out there that's been approved in the market um starting from over-the-counter uh, medications homeopathic medications um anything has a risk now what the risk is of the illness, which in COVID has kind of manifested itself this year, we see what that risk is, and it's not good. Um, and the benefit of a vaccine might outweigh the risk. I'm not saying that the, there is no risk to a vaccine, but we will be, 
as as Dan said, we, we will have to be vigilant as to what the studies show, what size of population they've tested, um, which right now is in the several dozen. But as they roll out the vaccine, there will be more reports. And in history tells us, uh, has shown us that many drugs um, after market um, are taken off the market for certain risks that are high. Um, I don't recall a vaccine that has had that uh, happen to it. So we're going to have to be vigilant. Well, wow. We ran out of, we're running, we ran out of time and we have a whole lot more questions left. So sorry if we didn't get to your question, but thank you so much, Eddie and Dan. This has been a really, really informative discussion here and we really appreciate you taking the time and um, speaking with us today. So Thank you for having us. We're going to say goodbye to you and move on to the the last part of our our webinar today. And I'm going to ask Mitch to come in and help us with some new news and breaking news, actually, that just came out yesterday. OK, so I'll be um, be, be quick on this. Um, this is in the handouts uh, for this webinar, but um, we, we've got from the AMA um, CPT um, committee that they actually have identified CPT codes for billing um, for, for a COVID vaccine. There will be an individual code for each vaccine and individual codes for each dose administered. And so this chart here lays it out um, with the codes and what it covers. So um, take a look at that, understand that, look that there is two different, um, there will be two different levels of reimbursement for each administration of the dose. Um, and that's been uh, shared last week uh, as well on this webinar. Next slide. Hi, so I'm gonna do this part. You normally see me during this part in the advocacy update. Um, I actually, I think Mitch is gonna do this one though. Mitch, do you wanna do this? We, we probably would say the same thing on this one, Elisa. So, you know, we, <laughs> our team has put together a, a uh, practice resource for you to use taking what we talked about earlier about the, the reimbursement rates for each of the doses of vaccine. Um, and it lays out a Q&A and, and we're gonna update it with the, or the recent AMA coding uh, as well. But this is a resource that you should look at and understand, you know, we've, we've advocated for coverage for the administration of these vaccines. We've got it for, for CMS, for, for Medicare, and it also encourages Medicaid and the private sector to follow suit in this guidance as well. So we'll be providing more information as it comes available, but this tool should help you understand what's going to be available. Great. Thanks, Mitch. So now I will give you the um, advocacy update, and I know we're running short on time, so we can get to the information you need for your CE. Um, you know, if you haven't been under a rock this past week, you know about the continued drama related to the election. and you know, how will this impact pharmacy and pharmacists? You know, there are a lot of unanswered questions, but so here's what we know based on what we're hearing from the Hill and from the Biden transition team. So let's first look at the executive branch. Typically when a new administration comes in, we start seeing people jumping into leadership of, of the agencies to examine the state of affairs at the agency and start looking at policy opportunities. We'll also likely see new leadership, particularly at FDA and CMS. A few names are being tossed around, but no definitive names uh, just of yet. One of the first actions from the Biden transition team is the establishment of a COVID-19 advisory panel. And he populated this team with noted experts and leaders in public health. So I think we're gonna start hearing more coming from this advisory panel, very prestigious and uh, group of people. On the Hill, the Democrats are maintaining a majority uh, in the House, but that majority was narrowed and it's looking like the Republicans will likely take the Senate again with a very slim margin. But we're also looking to see who takes leadership of the key committees that will impact public health and pharmacies. Many of those are, are changing, and so we'll we have to we'll start looking and keeping an eye on on who's going to fill those roles. And we do have two pharmacists in Congress. One, Buddy Carter, has been a champion of pharmacy for many years, 
and Diana Harshberger, who we uh, we know well from at APHA, who's also a, a pharmacist. So um, good to see them to help us in our efforts. On the next slide, just a reminder of our pediatric immunization refresher for pharmacists now available, and we have a an update webinar that here at these um, sites kind of going through so we can get to the CE stuff. Um, this week, starting tomorrow, if you can go to the next slide, starting tomorrow is the um, joint federal pharmacy uh, program that there's a lot of CE available. Go to this website. If you don't need the CE, we have the virtual uh, exhibit hall is open for anybody and you can go to this to the, the site also to register if you wanna just get access to the exhibit hall. Continue to use Engage. It's, our, it's the way for you all to communicate if you're a member and you want some information and post in, to post information and ask questions and concerns. And I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So the next webinar is gonna take place this time, next week, same time. And it's gonna cover the role of the technician in immunizations and testing during COVID-19. As you know, technicians have gotten increased authority from HHS, and we're gonna talk about that and talk with some tech technicians to, to talk about the impact and, and look at that new authority as well. So let's go to the CE information. So we're gonna do some polling for the questions. So for the first question, all the following ethical principles guiding ACIP's decisions regarding prioritization of groups to receive the COVID-19 accept justice, sustainability, transparency, equity, and maximize the benefits and minimize the harms. So if you can poll, start polling, choose your answer. And are we going to show the answers or the answer? Yep. 62% of you got the answer right. Sustainability. So let's go to the next question. Pharmacists and other healthcare providers who order and administer COVID-19 vaccine must follow the ACIP recommendations for prioritization. True or false? One of two choices. And polls are closed. The answer is true. 89% of you got that right. And the last question is, your pharmacy just received a shipment of COVID-19 vaccine. A patient picking up a prescription asked if she can receive the vaccine. What should your response be to the request? A, determine if the patient fits into the current ACIP designated priority group. B, determine if the patient is insured and has coverage for the vaccine. C, let the patient know she is ineligible for the vaccine. Or D, administer the vaccine immediately. So pick your choice. And the answer is, let's see what you guys came up with. Good, 99% of you got the got it correct. A, determine if the patient fits into the current ACIP designated priority group. Thank you very much. We're right on time. Appreciate our speakers again this week, Eddie and Dan, and we'll see you same time here next week. Goodbye.